Hi everybody, this is Dr. A. In this short series on immunochemistry, I'm going to bring you about three videos and we're going to start with uh, some basic concepts in immunochemistry. So in an immunoassay, an antibody molecule, usually IgG, recognizes and binds to an antigen, which is then what is trying to be detected. Now here's a little twist here for you. Uh, an antigen could just be a protein, so like a drug or um, a vitamin or something we're trying to detect, but an antigen could also be another antibody if we're trying to detect it. So you can have an antibody to an antibody. Antibodies um, that are used can be monoclonal or polyclonal. The monoclonal ones will come from the same plasma line and they're usually preferred because they're much more specific. Um, the polyclonal one will come from different plasma cell lines, uh, but still all directed against um, the same maybe microbe or um, you know protein. Because um, when you make an antibody to uh, an antigen to a, to a protein, there are different epitopes on that antigen, and so um, there are different places that the antibody could attach to, and the conformation of the antibody can uh, vary depending on the epitope that it's made against. So, you know, some assays will use more monoclonal antibodies for higher specificity, some may use some polyclonal antibodies. The antigen-antibody binding that happens is related to several things. The concentration of each reactant, so the concentration of antigens, the concentration of antibodies, um, the specificity of the antibody for the antigen. Um, so it does, is it cross-reacting or is it very specifically only reacting with that antigen? The affinity and avidity for that pair of antigen and body interaction and um, the environmental conditions. Uh, so that could be, you know, temperature and other things like that, acidity, uh, things that, you know, are in the environment of the reaction. So um, the antigen antibody bonding, how do they stick together, is due to electrostatic interactions, hydrogen bonds, hydrophobic interactions, and van der Waals forces. Uh, so let's define the terms affinity and avidity as related to antigen antibody bonding. So the affinity is the strength of the bond between antigen and the antibody. High affinity antibodies will bind more antigen and uh, it's the thermodynamic energy of interaction of a single antibody binding site plus its corresponding epitope on the antigen. And it is always a property of the antigen. So how well the antigen fits that antibody. Okay. The avidity is the stability of the complex once this has formed. So it is based on affinity, so on the strength of the bond, but also on the number of binding sites. Um, so overall, strength of binding of an antibody to an antigen and uh, it is a property of the antibody, so how stable the complex is. Um, so let's discuss in assay designs for immunoassays, heterogeneous versus homogeneous immunoassays. So uh, all the heterogeneous immunoassays require a separation step. That separation step could be a chemical precipitation. So there would be a protein precipitating chemical that would make the reaction visible. An immunologic precipitation, so you would have a second precipitating antibody that will allow then uh, the antigen antibody pairs to be visible. Uh, there could be a liquid phase adsorption, so the antigen is adsorbed onto uh, charcoal, for example, or maybe some latex particles. And um, you can also have solid phase adsor adsorption, so the uh, antigen is, um, or antibody is coated on um, a solid surface. So this could be wells in a microtiter well plate or beads or something else. Um, and the solid phase adsorption is actually easier to do and then to automate. So um, it's used quite a bit. So a homogeneous immunoassay does not require a separation step. All the reactions happen in the same vessel all at the same time. Um, this is often used in urine tests for drugs of abuse and therapeutic drug assays. Um, and in homogeneous assays, um, the, you would have a labeled antibody that binds to the analyte, and then that's what you would detect. Um, now, you use labeled antibodies and heterogeneous immunoassay, immunoassay also. So let's talk a little bit about those immunoassay labels. Um, so there are compounds that are used as detectors in immunoassays. 
An example of a label could be a fluorescent label, like fluorescing. It emits light that can be detected using a phototube and a fluorometer. Uh, chemiluminescent labels are now com commonly used, especially luminol or acridium esters. Um, they are also detected with a phototube. As a reminder, chemiluminescent is uh, light produced from a chemical reaction. And then we also have ra radioisotopes that can be used, um, but being radioactive, we use them less, but they can be used and they are detected. Um, it's the gamma rays that are being detected. Um, and the enzymes uh, are also commonly used too. So peroxidase, alkaline phosphatase, etc. And enzymes will often um, elicit a color change. And so that will, what is what is usually detected uh, and is detected by spectrophotometers. So immunoassay labels are chemically bonded to the antigen uh, or the antibody, if it's a labeled antibody, um, using a series of chemical reactions. This is done by the manufacturer, and then the instrumentation used to detect the label will depend on the type of label used, of course. So in assay designs, there's also competitive versus non-competitive immunoassays. <clears throat> so in a competitive immunoassay, there's always a competition between an, the unlabeled analyte from the sample and a labeled uh, antigen that's um, basically the equivalent of the analyte um, that is into reagents and they're competing for an antibody that is into reagent. So like if you were detecting, let's say, vitamin B12, and it was a competitive immunoassay, then you would have the vitamin B12 in the sample that's competing with labeled vitamin B12 in the reagent for an anti-vitamin B12 antibody. Okay. And uh, in those, the analyte concentration is always going to be inversely proportional to the signal uh, because the signal comes from the labeled antigen. So meaning um, the more labeled antigens can bind to the antibody, it means the less the unlabeled analyte was present. And so uh, as you see in this graph, a high signal would mean low concentration and a low signal would mean a high concentration of the uh, analyte in the sample. In a non-competitive immunoassay, um, they are also known as sandwich immunoassay. They also use labeled antibodies. Um, they do have the highest level of sensitivity and specificity, but the analyte concentration is directly proportional to the signal, uh, and the signal comes from the labeled antibody. And so it's a sandwich because you usually have a, a capture antibody that's fix on a bead or a plate or something, and uh, it captures the antigen, and then there's a second uh, antibody that can attach to it that has the label, that has the signal, um, and so uh, that is what is detected. So if the analyte is not present in the sample, so it will then it won't be captured by the capture antibody, and uh, then the signal antibody won't have anything to bind to, and so there will not be a signal. So if there's nothing, there won't be a signal. The more antigen is present, the more of it is going to be captured and, and bound, and the more the antibody, um, signal antibody will have to bind to, and the higher the signal will be. Um, the hook effect is uh, an issue with immunoassays. So you need excess antibody for a proper reaction in labeled immunoassays. Uh, so you need enough antibody to get a positive slope in, for the dose response curve. If the analyte is in excess, so if they, the, those levels are extremely high in the patient's sample, okay, then the curve ha flattens out, but then can become negatively sloped. Um, and so that you, you could have really high results that are reading deceptively lower. Um, so anytime there are any kind of questionable results with an immunoassay, it is good to run a quick dilution protocol on it to verify that the results are accurate. So if they're not confirmed with a dilution, there could be a severe underestimation of the true analyte concentration, and therefore that could affect um, the treatment of the patient. And so here is a representation of the hook effect. So as you can see here, so this is, you know, a normal going up dose response curve in it, but it keeps going and it can flatten out here as the concentration increases and then it starts going back down so that at this, this really high concentration here and this pretty high concentration there too, um, 
mind you, they're not the same, right? This one, this this level here is way higher than this one here. They would have the same signal, and so uh, with higher values, things around here, then it's always good to do a dilution protocol uh, to verify that the reading is actually accurate. And so um, also things that can interfere with immunoassay or heterophile antibodies. So um, they tend to interfere with sandwich immunoassays. Um, and the design disadvantage of the sandwich, sandwich immunoassays are that they are subjected to false positives and false negative interferences due to heterophile antibodies. So heterophile antibodies are formed from patients who have autoimmune disease or other disorders where they have an abundance of these antibodies. Um, and so it can create a hook type effect, which is similar to the prozone effect or the zone of antibody excess effect. So um, it just, yeah, there's too many antibodies, and so it basically interferes with the reaction properly taking place. So you could have um, an immunoassay, something that's reading negative or, or undetected when there actually is there. And um, a little bit on future directions for immunoassays. So um, we see more and more um, new instruments. Do, the large chemistry analyzers integrate immunochemistry with you know regular chemistry, you know the spectrophotometry and ion cell ele electrodes. And so nowadays those big chemistry analyzers are they all have an immunoassay module. Um, there is also a potential use of aptamers uh, instead of antibodies. So aptamers are single-stranded oligonucleotides that fold into defined architectures, defined shapes, and they can bind targets such as proteins. So they can kind of function as an antibody without being an antibody because they can bind and capture proteins, antigens that we may need to detect. So that's potential use. And then um, we have seen advancements in mass spectrometry where it is more sensitive and specific than immunoassay and has less interferences. So there are some assays that are going to mass spectrometry, uh, especially in reference labs. Um, so it just, yeah, there's, they're both there and they're competing. Um, you know, the manufacturers are always looking for greater sensitivity, specificity, and also uh, newer assays. So, all right, on our next video, we are going to do unlabeled immunoassays. I'll see you there.